We continue our look at the 50s here on the History Channel. Russian bomb ran so deep that the U.S. government exploded dozens of atomic weapons in the Nevada desert using thousands of its own soldiers as guinea pigs. The vacuum created by the terrific blast at 3,500 feet sucks up the sand like a cyclone and creates a veritable sandstorm that envelops GIs emerging from their foxholes. The shock waves knocked many flat. Within seconds, the familiar mushroom develops and rises to 35,000 feet with a vortex of sand rising to meet the bottom of the cone. Mobilized to carry out the most formidable engineering job in history were thousands of the nation's industrial firms of every size and type. Working on After World War II, jobs, nuclear weapons became the centerpiece of American defense policy. Anything. The Pentagon thought that the atomic bomb would provide a better and cheaper alternative to conventional forces. Here it is, General Grove, plutonium. Once the Russians had a bomb of their own, the race now began to build the ultimate weapon, the hydrogen bomb. In fact, the president in particular had never heard of the idea of a hydrogen bomb until October 1949. There was so little military necessity for this weapon, if you will, that no one had even bothered to mention it to him. Nor had the Joint Chiefs heard of the idea. But within five minutes of the time President Truman heard, he asked two questions, according to Sidney Sowers, who was his head of the National Security Council. Can we do it? And Sowers said, well, Mr. President, the scientists say we can. And then the president said, well, hell, why aren't we? Physicist Edward Teller had been asking just that question for many years. A member of the team that produced the Hiroshima bomb, he called his design for his new bomb the Super and urged America to develop it quickly. On the basis of present trends. We must conclude that 10 years from now, Russia will be way ahead of us. I say that this will happen, not unless we do this or that. I simply say it will happen. If there is another world war, this civilization may go under. Robert Oppenheimer, leader of the original atomic bomb effort, had grave doubts that any new weapon could guarantee peace. We need, I think, to learn to understand the realities of life abroad, not so much in terms of slogans as in terms of the lives of men. In our response to these realities, there is hope for peace. Edward Teller had difficulty recruiting scientists to his team. Key candidates argued that development of the super wasn't necessary or moral. In my strong head opinion, the scientists have one extremely important role, and that is to make the best possible science, to find the facts, to find the possibilities, and at that point, their responsibility stops. What to do with the result is up to everybody, and through, in a democratic society, through the elected politicians, the public will has to come to the fore. I have the confidence that if we scientists find the facts, the democratic system, in the end, can develop the right applications. While Teller was willing to do what the government wanted, Oppenheimer was not. He was deeply troubled by the destruction he and his colleagues had visited upon Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He warned that escalating a nuclear arms race would threaten life on Earth. It was Teller's view that prevailed with the politicians. In 1950, when President Truman authorized the H-bomb program, resistance within the scientific community grew. For this, Teller blamed Oppenheimer. 
Teller is already wary and hostile, more than he knows, I think, towards Oppenheimer. And now he believes that Oppenheimer is trying to stop his bomb. He doesn't say it was more difficult because we could never get the mathematical equation right. He blames it on Oppie for an undertow, and this is the symbolic event. Robert Serber, the physicist who supervised the design of the Hiroshima bomb, was Oppenheimer's disciple and friend. Oppie to turn on the charm and so could Edward. And uh, they both were quite vocal. Oppie was one of the few men I ever knew that spoke in English sentences. Uh, they, uh, perhaps, perhaps I had a similarity was contributed to, uh, to Teller's feeling of, feeling of inferiority when Oppenheimer was so acclaimed. And uh, Teller was ambitious. Teller now had his own chance for scientific glory to show that he, like Oppenheimer, could develop a superweapon. The young man who first came to the United States as a refugee from the Nazis now led the largest American scientific effort since World War II. Was I ever afraid in connection with war? Yes. When I saw Hitler, I was afraid. When I saw the atomic bomb or the hydrogen bomb, I was not. Why not? Because I knew that there is always plenty of power in any stage of development to do practically unlimited damage. Knowledge is important. The only thing I am afraid of is not knowledge, is the people who use the knowledge. And there I did not have reason to be afraid in the case of the United States developing more perfect weapons. Teller's faith in the good judgment of American democracy was matched only by his fear of the Russians. He once told a colleague that if he didn't build the super, the Russians would take over the United States and he would be their prisoner. To imagine that he would be a prisoner of the Russians within the United States if we didn't build a hydrogen bomb tomorrow is an irrational statement. There's no question that those weren't nice people. There's no question that that was a terrible criminal regime. But there is much question that they were the real drivers of the arms race. We were the country, the United States was the country, with one notable exception, and that only briefly, that invented the new weapons that the Soviets then followed on and built themselves. History turns its most ominous page far out in mid-Pacific, where in the enemy talk at all, the world's most awesome weapon is readied for detonation. It the took two to years to build Edward Teller's super bomb. At 10.4 megatons, it was a thousand times more powerful than the Hiroshima weapon. Well, the trouble with the super was that uh, not only that it could be made arbitrarily large, but it couldn't be made arbitrarily small and nobody knew exactly how small you could make it, but uh, it was intrinsically thought to be a weapon that necessarily had to be many megatons. And uh, there was certainly no military uh, use for such, for such a big bomb, and, uh, and there, in fact, there was very little use for it at all because uh, the same amount, the same uh, tonnage in smaller bombs would be more destructive. Are you satisfied from the radiological standpoint, Commander Manor? Yes, sir. The situation is ideal since the entire fallout pattern is to the north of the inhabited islands. Thank you, Joe. No one, not even the scientists who had built the bomb, knew what the results of the test would be. Niner, eight, seven, six, five, Who had seen a lot of nuclear tests.
test by 1952, who, when they saw the mic test, were frightened. It just seemed to keep coming at them as they, as they stood on their ships watching this thing grow and grow until, until the mushroom cloud was 100 miles across. With the super, America regained its nuclear preeminence. Nine months later, the Soviet Union successfully tested an H-bomb of its own. Robert Oppenheimer's opposition to the hydrogen bomb was interpreted by government officials as disloyalty to the United States. In hearings held by the Atomic Energy Commission, he was stripped of his security clearance and retired to academic life a broken man. Edward Teller was treated as an outcast by many of his colleagues for testifying against Oppenheimer, but he won the battle of the super. He would go on to advise the government on nuclear issues throughout the Cold War. Next on the History Channel, the U.S. prepares its civilians for nuclear war as the race for more powerful nuclear weapons continues. Less than two minutes after the take cover signal, the streets were cleared. Times Square is deserted. Stay with us here on the History Channel.